Okay, please open to Romans chapter 12. And we're looking at the end of Romans chapter 12. Uh, so let me begin again reading in Romans chapter 12 and verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So the, uh, the primary reason why I went to this passage at this time is uh, we're going through Romans and I'm trying to select any verse that I think has at least some loose connection with, uh, with the coming of Christ. And so um, the point I made in verse 19 is that it's often said that one of the differences between the rapture and the second coming is that the second coming is wrath. And so if you're looking forward to the second coming, you'd be looking for wrath. But the rapture, there's no wrath. It's all blessing and salvation and such. So you wouldn't be looking for any wrath whatsoever. But in verse 19, um, it seems to me, at least in this context, that Paul does teach us that we are, in a sense, looking for wrath. So again, in verse 19, he says, rather give place unto wrath. And then he says, uh, it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And so as we talked about that in more detail, um, but it seems to me there clearly is a sense in this passage in which when we speak of the coming of Christ, we also are looking for it as being a time of wrath and vengeance. And then we began last time talking about verse 20, and especially that phrase, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. And I mentioned what I believe are the two most common interpretations of that phrase. So one uh, that I've heard many times is this story about how your neighbor runs out of coals for his hearth to cook food and keep the house warm. So he comes over to your house to borrow some coals, um, some hot coals. And instead of just giving him a couple, which won't last long, you heap, you give him a heap of coals. Um, you, you do good to him in that way by giving him a heap of coals. And then it's a heap of coals of fire on his head. And so the story goes then that at that time they would carry the coals on their head in some kind of a container on their head. So uh, I believe a, a fatal flaw to that interpretation is that has you doing three good acts. But in verse 20, there's only two. So the first one in verse 20 is feed him, feed, the, feed him if he's hungry. The second one is give him drink if he's thirsty, and that's all there is. So that interpretation I mentioned, that says there's a third act, and that is giving your neighbor coals of fire. But that's that doesn't fit the wording. The wording is you feed him, you give him drink, for in so doing, in so doing those two things, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. So I think that's a fatal flaw for that interpretation. Uh, and plus, as I mentioned, although that, that sounds like a nice sentimental story, there's no such example in the word of God um, of handling coals in that manner. And I don't think there's even any good uh, evidence for that in secular literature. It's just kind of a story that somebody made up that he thought that that would help fit this verse. Um, so I think that's that's another problem with it. Um, I'll also, you know, when I, when I think about that interpretation, if you have a heap of coals of fire, that's really, really hot. If any of you have worked with coals at all on a grill or anything. So I don't think I'd want to put coals on top of my head in any kind of container. I don't know what kind of container you would use that you wouldn't end up burning your head. 
or maybe starting the container on fire. So that's uh, there are a number, I think, problems with that. And then a second interpretation is that uh, you are doing good things, these two good things in verse 20, giving food and giving drink, so that you can make your enemy feel ashamed or feel guilty and, and bring him to repentance. Um, and that's a couple problems with that interpretation is uh, there are there are several times in scripture where coal or coals is mentioned and we, we will look at some of those today but there are there's no scripture that i can see where it's associated with shame or repentance or guilt so that would mean this would be the only verse where it has that meaning um and, and there are some other problems we talked about also with that interpretation. Um, another thing is it seems to me that's kind of a sneaky motivation to do good to someone, that you're, you're kind to someone or do good to them with a motivation that you want to make them feel ashamed or feel guilty. So that doesn't really seem like something that, that the word of God would teach or that Paul would teach. So my understanding, um, what I believe verse 20 is saying, is that you he, when we do good to our enemies, and, and the context does clearly seem to, to have to do with enemies, therefore if thine enemy hunger, and so forth. So when we do good to our enemies, we are bringing more severe judgment upon them. So our acts of kindness are heaping more and more judgment upon them. And uh, as I mentioned last time, one, I think, obvious objection that some people would have to my understanding is that if it's a bad motivation to do good to people, to try to make them feel ashamed or guilty, it seems like maybe even a worse motivation to do good to them to try to bring more judgment upon them. So I want to uh, tonight support or defend or explain why I believe that is what the verse is saying, um, and then also respond to the, the, that objection. All right, so first of all, again, the, word, the words coal and coals are used several times in scripture, and by far the majority of the verses are talking about the wrath and judgment of God, and especially his wrath at, the, at his second coming. So uh, we won't look at all of them, but I, I want to look at a few so you can see what I'm talking about. So let's first of all turn to 2 Samuel chapter 22. 2 Samuel chapter 22. And so again, as we read these passages, we want to take note of the word coal or coals um, and see what, what the meaning is. All right, so 2 Samuel chapter 22, and uh, I will begin reading in verse 8. Then the earth shook and trembled. All right, so right away there, we know we're in the second coming context. Continuing in verse 8, the foundations of heaven moved and shook because he was wroth. And so clearly the context of the wrath of God. Verse 9, there went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. So in the context of the second coming of Christ and, and his wrath being poured out, it says in verse 9 that there is fire out of his mouth and coals were kindled by it. Verse 10, he bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a, cher a cherub and did fly and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. And he made darkness pavilions round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Through the brightness before him were coals of fire kindled. So there's there's that exact expression, coals of fire. Um, and again, clearly 
in the context of uh, God's wrath being poured out at the second coming. And then verse 14, the Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered his voice. And he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and discomfited them. All right, so that passage is very clear as far as the significance of coals and coals of fire. All right, then let's turn to Psalm 18. <clears throat> and in Psalm 18, Gene Gross would read verses 7 through 15. So Psalm 18, verses 7 through 15. Okay. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed, hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them and he shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Then the channels of waters were seen and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke. O oh Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils. Okay, so this is very much like the passage I just read in 2 Samuel. Uh, again, clearly the second coming of Christ and the pouring out of his wrath. So the end of verse 8 says, coals were kindled by it. And then um, verse, uh, the end of verse 12, again, coals of fire. And the end of verse 13, coals of fire. Okay, and then Psalm 140, 140, Psalm 140, and Dan Rupers, would you read verses 9 through 11? Psalm 149 through 11. As for the head of those that that compass me about, let the mischief of their own lips cover them. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits that they may not rise up again. Let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. Evil shall hunt the violent man to overthrow him. Okay, so again, it's clearly in a, a second coming context, God pouring out his wrath. And verse 10 says, let burning coals fall upon them. Then let's go to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 24. And in Ezekiel chapter 24, Dennis, would you read verses 9 through 13? Ezekiel 24, 9 through 13. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, woe to the bloody city. I will even make the pile for fire great. Heap on wood, kindle the fire, consume the flesh and spice it well and let the bones be burned. Then set it empty upon the coals thereof that the brass of it may be hot and may burn and that the filthiness of it may be molten in it that the scum of it may be consumed. She hath wearied herself with lies, and her great scum went not forth out of her. Her scum shall be in the fire, in thy filthiness in is lewdness, because, if, because I have purged thee, and thou wast not purged, thou shalt not be purged from thy filthiness any more, till I have caused my fury to rest upon thee. And so, again, clearly a passage speaking about judgment or wrath. And uh, in verse, um, so verse 9, 
Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, woe to the bloody city. So you can see right away the context of it there. And then in verse 11, then set it empty upon the coals thereof. Okay, and then uh, we'll just look at one more. We could look at a few more, but we'll just look at one more. And that is in the book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 3. And in Habakkuk chapter 3, Dick, would you read verses 4 and 5? Okay, uh, Habakkuk 3, 4, and 5. <clears throat> and his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand, and there was the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence, and burning coals went forth at his feet. Okay, and again, the same context of the second coming and God's wrath being poured out. And verse 5 says, burning coals went forth at his feet. Okay, then let's go back to Romans 12. So, um, again, we, we looked at a few passages. There are more we could look at. Uh, and again, there are places in the Word of God where coals are mentioned simply in the sense of literal coals to cook food or warm the house. But um, the majority by far of references are like we read, uh, speaking God's wrath being poured out at the second coming. So I believe this is a strong argument um, as far as when we come to Romans 12 and verse 20, as far as what, the, what that means. Yeah, so it, it seems far better for me to interpret that phrase coals of fire in Romans 12, 20 based upon how the word coal or coals or coals of fire is used in the word of God, rather than simply trying to imagine what it might mean. Uh, so again, I, I think that's a very strong argument. And then um, th this interpretation, as I mentioned, might, might initially seem kind of uncomfortable. Um, but I don't believe it's any more of a problem than what Paul says in verse 19, the, the previous verse. So again, in verse 19, Paul says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So Paul quotes from, from a passage, uh, as we've seen, speaking about God's vengeance coming upon Israel in the last days. Um, and so because of the verse that Paul quotes, I don't believe we can truly say that the interpretation that I gave is out of context or contrary to the context at all. I think, in fact, it perfectly fits the context when, when you look at verse 19. Uh, and then I, I believe this understanding that I've given is um, also in, it's in line with the scriptural meaning of coals of fire, as we've seen. And I believe it's also in line with the context here in Romans 12, again, especially looking at verse 19. So does this interpretation contradict Paul's teaching about grace? Or does this interpretation require that you have an evil motive for doing good works, doing uh, showing kindness toward people? And, and I don't think so. Um, so there, some people treat us kindly, some people ignore us, and some actively oppose us. So for those who treat us kindly, it's generally quite easy for us to treat them well. And for those who ignore us, we may be able to bring ourselves to show kindness toward them. But it's very much against human nature to do good to our enemies. And yet Paul teaches that we should do good to all men, 
um, in in this context, but look uh, look for a moment at Galatians chapter six. Galatians chapter six and Dominic, would you read verse ten? As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Okay, so as we have opportunity, we are to do good unto all men. And that would include our enemies, um, as if you go back to Romans chapter 12. So this is one thing that should make us noticeably different from the world. Uh, in in the world, it's natural if someone is nice to you that you probably will be nice to them. And as I said, if they just kind of ignore you, you might be able to be nice to them. But it's not natural to be nice to your enemies or do good to your enemies. And yet, Paul clearly teaches that we should. So what what will enable us to do good even to our enemies? which again is not natural. Uh, and there are several things that Paul has already taught in Romans before you come to this passage in chapter 12 that would be a great help for us to have this kind of attitude toward our enemies. And in addition to the things that he's already taught, Paul adds another motivation in this passage. So, and the motivation here is that we should not feel as we go through this life that we have to make things right and defend ourselves whenever we're wronged. Instead, we should understand from God's word that there's a day of judgment coming and that one day God will deal with all injustice and evil. He and he will do so righteously, of course. And so our motivation for doing good to people, even our enemies, is not one of anger or hatred or revenge, or even to make them feel ashamed or guilty, but instead, it's an attitude that we can just relax. And again, not feel like we have to get back at everyone who wrongs us or um, make right all the wrongs done to us we can just relax um, and, and treat our enemies with kindness because we trust that if there indeed is any true injustice, God will deal with it and he will deal with it in the right way. We don't have to do that ourselves. So our motivation is not avenging ourselves or getting back at our enemies but it's rather confidence in God's righteousness and God's just justice. He will take care of things. So we don't have to worry ourselves about it or again, seek revenge in this life. And so verses 19 and 20, uh, I believe are an encouragement to us that God, God is gonna set everything right. Um, look back in chapter 8 in Romans. Romans chapter 8, and would Dan or Lisa read verse 31? So Romans chapter 8 and verse 31. All right. What shall we say? What shall we say then? Say to these things, if God be for us, who can be against us? So we we know as members of the body of Christ, we know that God is for us. And uh, then when you come to Romans chapter 12, and he speaks about enemies and people in verse 18, uh, people who refuse to live peaceably with us. So again, we know God is for us. And so we can relax and just, as it says in verse 19, give place unto wrath. There's no reason for us to seek revenge um, unless we doubt that God will one day set everything right. But if we believe what these verses and other passages tell us, then we don't, again, we don't have to try to right all the wrongs done to us in this life. 
And we also understand that this is not the time of God's wrath. This is the dispensation of the grace of God. Um, and yet, yet we also know that there is a day of wrath coming, as we just read several passages about it. So at this time in the dispensation of the grace of God, although the world surely is worthy of the wrath of God, God at this time is being patient and forgiving and kind and gracious. So we ought to be that way also in this dispensation. So like, like God, we know that there is a day of wrath coming, but this is not that day of wrath. This is the time to be gracious and, and long-suffering, patient, and kind. So I don't think that understanding verse 20 in, in the way that I have mentioned um, is in any way contrary toward, uh, toward having an attitude of grace with others. In fact, I think it, if we understand this, it helps us to have an attitude of grace toward others. So our, our first desire of course, would be that, that everyone be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth but um, and be friends with us, but we know that that's not always going to happen. In fact, in many cases, it won't. So in those cases, we just give place to wrath. Um, we believe God will deal with each person according to his holiness and justice. And that should be, a, again, a great comfort and encouragement to us. And again, enable us to just relax and do good to all men, even to our enemies. So I believe that's, the, that's what verse 19 and 20 are teaching. Um, and I believe that the heaping coals of fire on his head are to be understood in that context. Uh, and then also, it seems to me that in this passage, Paul, as I've spoken about earlier, is primarily, if not exclusively, speaking of unsaved people. Um, if you look back in Romans chapter 12 and verse 17, he says, Recompen recompense to no man. So he's not just talking about the saints, but no man, evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. Again, not just the saints, but all men. And then if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Um, and then verse uh, 20, if thine enemy hunger. So God's desire and is and our desire should be, again, that they get saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. But in the current in their current state of unbelief, at this moment, they're headed for judgment if they've not yet believed. So God knows that, and yet he's being gracious toward them and being long-suffering toward them. And so we should have the same attitude toward them that God has toward them. So that's, uh, that's my understanding of this passage and, and the heaping coals of fire on his head. Uh, as we've seen, that the, the word coals and that phrase of, of coals of fire are found other places in Scripture, and it's very clear the meaning they have. And again, I think that would fit very well with the context here in Romans 12. Um, now, as I mentioned when we started talking about verse 19, Paul is quoting here from Proverbs 25. So let's go back and briefly look at that again. So Proverbs chapter 25, <clears throat> and Meg, would you read verses 21 and 22? Proverbs 25, 21 and 22. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. Okay, so again, this clearly is what Paul is quoting in Romans 12. But notice that Paul does not 
quote the end of verse 22. So he doesn't quote, and the Lord shall reward thee. He, he leaves that out of his quotation. Uh, and so why, why does he do that? I believe that the primary reason that Paul does not quote the end of verse 22 is in the context of Proverbs chapter 25, um, when it says in verse 22, and the Lord shall reward thee, in the context here, the reward is material blessing in the earthly kingdom. But that's not what Paul's talking about in Romans 12 or, or in Romans. Um, so that, that wouldn't fit the context of Romans 12 and, and the context of the dispensation of the grace of God to talk about receiving material blessings in an earthly kingdom. So I, I believe that's the primary reason why he leaves, why he doesn't quote that part. Um, and then go back to Romans 12. And I believe there may be another reason why Paul does not quote that part of the verse. And that is in Romans chapter 12. Richard, would you read verse 1? Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So the things that Paul's talking about in this chapter, he says, are our reasonable service. So you don't get a reward for simply doing your reasonable service. And so I think that's another reason why Paul does not quote that part of the verse um, because of what he says here at the very beginning of the chapter. Okay, and then just to complete this chapter, uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 21 says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So the, the result of being kind to our enemies, giving them food and drink, is not that our enemies feel ashamed or guilty or repent or any such thing. Paul doesn't say anything like that. Instead, he says the result of doing what it says in verse 20 is in verse 21 that we will not be overcome of evil, but we will overcome evil with good. So the the result or the effect is not that it changes our enemy, the attitude of our enemy, but that it changes us so that we are not overcome of evil. So we we will not succumb to evil and allow it to get the better of us. Um, we, we won't become bitter, angry, revengeful people. That's the result of understanding verses 19 and 20. It, it helps us to come to have the, this attitude that, uh, again, in verse 19, that we are to give place unto wrath and to understand that vengeance is mine. Uh, I will repay, saith the Lord. So, again, in this sense that we've talked about, we, in fact, are looking forward um, at Christ's coming, not only to salvation and blessing, but in this context, we also are looking forward to his wrath and vengeance that will take place at his coming. All right, then, um, then I want to go on to chapter 13. And in chapter 13, um, if you notice the end of verse 2, it's, uh, it speaks about receiving to themselves damnation. And then if you look at uh, verse 4, it talks about executing wrath. And also in verse 5, it talks about wrath. And so one of the things I want to do is we're going through Paul's epistles and picking out certain verses uh, is I, I want to at least briefly look at every time Paul uses the word wrath um, or talks about judgment or, in, again, in verse 2, he uses the word damnation. Uh, and so for that reason, I want to look at 
some of these verses here early in, in uh, Romans chapter 13. And so again, in Romans 13 and verse two, it says, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of, of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So looking at verse two, do we need to fear damnation? Um, and again, in the context of what we've been talking about, do we need to fear that if we're on earth during the 70th week or at the second coming of Christ, um, do we need to fear damnation? And so my intention is, is not to give a real lengthy, detailed exposition of Romans 13. However, um, I do want to talk about it some, again, because of the words damnation and wrath here. And it's difficult to resist, um, at least taking enough time to look at the context here and, uh, and try to see just what Paul is saying here. Uh, and, and of course, he's talking about government and um, our relationship to government, how we should view government. Uh, and so I, I want to, and I may somewhat for a little bit here, in a sense, kind of get off the topic that we're especially talking about, but I'm doing so deliberately because, um, again, I want to talk about it because of the words damnation and wrath. And then doing that, I want to take a little time and, and try to understand what Paul's talking about here. All right, so Romans chapter 13, and would Bonsinger Joyce read verse 1? Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers and the beings are being of God. Okay, and so th this is, um, I guess, always, but uh, certainly at this time, uh, this time in America anyway, and in some other places in the world, I think is uh, quite a relevant topic and, and can be a rather heated discussion. Uh, and so I, again, I'm not trying, I'm not going to, uh, certainly tonight or today, I'm not going to try to fully talk about this, um, but we will begin. So looking at verse one, it seems clear that God has established human government, that he, he has established human power. But it's also very clear um, if you, look through human history, that there are many cases where human governments have abused their authority. And so uh, he says here that we should not, in verses one and two, that we should not resist what God has established. But we have to carefully study and understand exactly what Paul is saying in, the, in this passage. So it's nearly always the case that men, um, and we can even say Christians, on, on pretty much any topic, some will go to one extreme and others will go to the other extreme. And so we don't want to go to any extreme. We want to understand what the word of God says and then believe that and obey that. So again, I want to take some time to consider what God's word says regarding this topic. Uh, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And again, I want to make it clear that what I'm going to say today is not the end all and be all on this topic. It's just beginning. Um, but there are some who on this topic use 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And would Tim or Jean read verse 23? Okay. First Corinthians 7, 23. Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. So some use this verse to uh, suggest that we should resist any government that uh, abuses its authority. That we should not be the servants of men. He says, be not ye the servants of men. 
But we have to understand this verse in its context. Um, this verse, in fact, is giving a further reason. If you if you go back to uh, in First Corinthians chapter seven again, a kun would you read verses twenty one and twenty two? But thou call being a servant, care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise, also he that is called, being free, is Christ's servant. Okay, so in this context, Paul is talking about not trying to change your social status. So uh, in verse 21, art thou called being a servant? He doesn't say then you got to run away or quit or rebel or something. He says, care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's freeman. So he doesn't say you have to rebel against being a servant or run away or any such thing. But he says you should understand, even though you may be a servant socially, um, you are the Lord's freeman. And then likewise, also, he that is called being free is Christ's servant. And so he points to the important thing is not your social status, how much freedom or servant to servanthood you are under with men. But the point is, the, the primary point is your relationship with the Lord. And so when you come to verse 23, um, he says, ye are bought with a price, be not ye the servants of men. He's giving a further reason in verse 23 to be unconcerned about the social distinctions or social status that are made. So in verse 23, he says, ye, and that would be both the, the believing servant and the believing free man. Ye are bought with a price. And Paul has already taught that uh, in 1 Corinthians. Laura, would you read 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20? First Corinthians chapter six, verse 20. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Okay, so he already back here in verse 20 says ye are bought with a price. And now again in chapter seven and verse 23, he says ye are bought with a price. So as believers, we do not belong to any human master. Even if our, in our social status or position, we are a servant, we know that ultimately we don't belong to any human master. We've been bought with a price. Um, turn to the Gospel of John chapter eight. John chapter eight and um, beginning in verse 33. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin, is the servant of sin. So even if you are not a servant in society, even if you hold a high position and you're free, Christ let them know, and these are high position religious leaders here, and he lets them know again in verse 34, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. And so that's the ultimate and the best freedom, is to be free indeed. Um, understanding that 
again, no matter what our social position now, we don't, we're not owned by any human master, nor do we have to be a servant to sin. As, um, if we're justified by faith, then we're free from sin, as we've seen earlier in Romans. So we've been bought with a price, the, the blood of the blood that Christ shed on the cross, and we've been made free. And so it's not necessary to have a change in our social status to be free indeed. It's only necessary to be in Christ. If we are in Christ, then we are free indeed. Uh, you can go back then to uh, 1 Corinthians 7 if you're not there. So Paul knew what it was like, uh, of course, to, to have your societal freedom taken away because he was put in prison. So in society's thinking, Paul was not free, he was in prison. But while he was in prison, you, you never find, reading through his epistles, that his concern was getting out of prison. He never tried to break out of prison, he never tried to get a movement started up uh, to get him out and so forth. But instead, while he was in prison, he rejoiced in Christ. And he spoke to those in prison about salvation in Christ. Okay, then uh, again in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 23, he says, Ye are bought with a price, be not ye the servants of men. And so I believe it's clear in the context again that it's not necessary for a servant to gain his freedom so that he can obey what it says in verse 23. He can remain in his position as a servant. In fact, Paul suggests that in this context, and yet not be the servant of men. So it's again, it's a matter of understanding the, the liberty, the freedom that we have in Christ. Um, and in fact, desiring to be set free setting your mind and your motivation on being set free from being a servant, um, the, the, having a strong desire to have a change in your social status, that in effect itself can kind of enslave us with our attitude. Um, and again, cause us to be bitter and uh, revengeful and so forth. It, it can en enslave us to focusing more on human distinctions rather than focusing on who we are in Christ. Uh, turn to Colossians chapter 3. So Paul did not teach that the saints should be revolutionaries, protesting and seeking to overturn social institutions. In Colossians chapter 3, and beginning in verse 22. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ, but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. So God's word is that servants should obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. And it says that a, a servant should serve his master heartily. And then, uh, and so if, if the servant lives by faith and the, the, uh, in, in this area and obeys the word of God and serves his master heartily, then he can know, as it says, that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. And what if the master is cruel, cruel and mistreats you, well, he says in verse 25 that we also can know that he that doeth wrong 
shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. So that takes us back again to what we were talking about in Romans 12, that we don't have to take it upon ourselves to set everything right in this life, but we can give place unto wrath and know that God is going to set everything right. And then turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 1. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. So again, Paul doesn't teach here to have a rebellious, revolutionary, uh, discontent kind of an attitude. But he says, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor. And then verse 2, and they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. So if, if you have a master who's a believing master, Paul says, let them not despise them. And then verse 3, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. So after what he says in verses 1 and 2 about servants, then in verse 3, Paul warns that no man teach otherwise. And then uh, we'll conclude today with verse 4. Um, going back to verse 3, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. So, um, again, that's not all there is to say, and it's not all that I'm going to say um, on the topic of what Romans 13 is talking about. Um, but I think I think it's important. And uh, that verse, 1 Corinthians 7, 23, again, which some use to say that we should not allow ourselves to be a servant to any man, that's in the context. That's not what that's saying. Um, and when you look at other scriptures, that's not what that's saying. All right, we will stop there for today. Thank you all. Thank you, Dan. Good night, everyone. Bye, Dan.